Warm welcome, Your Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, friends, partners, colleagues, everyone. Uh, welcome to the British Library, uh, where I have the great pleasure of being Chief Executive. And welcome to a little bit of London that is forever Jaipur. There is a sense of intense homecoming as we return, even though virtually, to JLF in London. It's been a huge privilege to partner with the British Library and this collaboration has been so full of joy and learning. It's a particular pleasure for me to come back to the British Library, which has been my office in London for many years, um, and uh, where uh, my books have all been written and researched, and it's very nice to see this end of, uh, of my life sort of double back on it. Our amazing writers, today more than any time, because of the way the digital age has taken over, we need you to be able to make sense of the past, divine the future, and perhaps set in context what we're going through at this very point of time. Um, this is the first time I've been to it in London. I've been to the one in Rajasthan before uh, and it's fantastic. Uh, it's got a different vibe here but it's, it's equally wonderful here. Uh, JLF brings this amazing uh, festival to London. It's a wonderful get-together of writers and thinkers and you know I, I, I only go to one festival, literature festival in the world and it's this one. people who've been here, both bookshop customers, the authors and the organisers, have been an absolute delight to work with. I can honestly say as well that this is the best dressed, most elegantly dressed crowd at any literary festival I've ever seen anywhere. It's maintained the, the standards which I'm accustomed to in Jaipur itself and I'm extremely happy to be part of it here. I love this festival. I think it's a privilege for me. JLF deserves enormous congratulations for the way that it puts its program together here. Uh, I think all of, the, uh, all of the events are superbly uh, chaired. I think that the setting here in the British Library is uh, is uh, just a, a fantastic uh, environment. Welcome to JLF London at the British Library for the last session of JLF London, presented in partnership with the Aga Khan Foundation and our patron, the Murthy Family Foundation. Our magazine partner for this series is The Week, Journalism with a Human Touch. Our last session of the day is in search of the anarchy, treasures of the East India Company from the India Office Collection of the British Library. In August 1765, the East India Company defeated the young Mughal emperor and forced him to establish in his richest provinces a new administration run by English merchants who collected taxes through means of a ruthless private army, what we would now call an act of involuntary privatization. The East India Company's founding charter authorized it to wage war, and it has always used violence to gain its ends. But the creation of this new government marked the moment that the East India Company ceased to be a conventional international trading corporation dealing in silks and spices and became something much more unusual, an aggressive colonial power in the guise of a multinational business. The company's reach stretched until almost all of India, south of the Himalayas, was effectively ruled from a boardroom in London. The anarchy tells the remarkable story of how one of the world's most magnificent empires disintegrated and came to be replaced by a dangerously unregulated private company based thousands of miles overseas in one small office, five windows wide, and answerable only to
to its distant shareholders. In his most ambitious and riveting book to date, William Dalrymple unfolds a timely cautionary tale of the first global corporate power. William Dalrymple recorded this lecture within the British Library, which houses the archives of the East India Company, where he takes us on an illustrated tour of high stakes betrayal with curator Maloney Roy, who reveals the documents that changed the course of history. William Dalrymple is the best-selling author of In Xanadu, City of Jinns, From the Holy Mountain, Age of Kali, White Mughals, The Last Mughal, Nine Lives, Return of a King, and Kohinoor. His new books are The Anarchy, which is a bestseller, and The Relentless Rise of the East India Company, and of course, Forgotten Masters, Indian Paintings for the East India Company. Dalrymple is one of the founders and co-directors of the Jaipur Literature Festival. Malini Roy is Head of Visual Arts at the British Library, responsible for collections of South Asian art and photography. She curated the library's exhibition, Mughal India, Art, Culture and Empire in 2012, and has written extensively on later Mughal painting, specifically on the historical portraits of the Mughal emperors, Muhammad Shah and Aurangzeb. William Dalrymple will join us post the film and will be available for the question and answer session. So do please post your questions in the comment section below. As you know, all our sessions are available to view on london.jlffest.org and on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can log back on london.jlflitfest.org. Please do help us keep JLF London at the British Library, which is a free festival alive and kicking by donating generously in the link provided below. And please do support the British Library for all the work that they're doing by donating to their link. Ladies and gentlemen, in search of the anarchy, treasures of the East India Company from the India Office Collection of the British Library. My name is William Dalrymple. I am one of the co-directors and co-founders of the Jaipur Literature Festival uh, and our London home is here in the British Library. The British Library is also the place which I have come to wearing my other hat, that of a historian, and I'm the author of The Anarchy, most recently, uh, which is based very largely on documents kept in this building. Because the British Library contains, among all its many other amazing treasures, almost the entire records of the East India Company, the world's first multinational corporation, which over a period of 200 years gobbled up from one office in London, the richest empire in the world, the Mughal Empire, which then controlled about 40% of the world's gross domestic product at a time when England was producing about 1.7%. And the records of that company are stacked in the vaults beneath me here. Beneath me are uh, story after story of storage space going down deep into the ground. And there are literally miles of reports, secret intelligence, um, office memos, chits, letters, pleas, legal decisions, military documents, um, giving the entire history of this extraordinary moment in, in the history of the British Empire when a corporation, not the British government, took over the richest country in the world. This item over here in the White Mount is actually the Treaty of Allahabad that was signed on exactly the 16th day of August 1765. And in the preceding years, um, the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II aligned forces with local provincial rulers to fight against the British. But as a consequence of their defeat at the Battle of Buxar, the Mughal Emperor was uh, required to hand over the dominions of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa to the British. 
and pay a warrant indemnity of 50 lakhs. This document changed everything. And this is a document that's called the Diwani. It looks just a perfectly normal legal document with a few nice uh, Islamic stamps on it and a few signatures. It doesn't look uh, very remarkable in itself. But this is one of the most important documents in the history of the world, quite simply. It's the document that changed India from being a, a free nation uh, into being the property, really, of a multinational corporation, the East India Company. It, it's a document whose implications were so wide-ranging that it altered the entire balance of world trade. Up to this point, from the Roman times onwards, gold from Europe had sailed across the ocean in return for the goods of India. Initially, uh, people were interested in pepper and spices, often brought from further east, from the Malaccas and so on. Uh, later on, textiles became important. But throughout the history, uh, since maybe 500 BC, right up until uh, the time this document was signed, which is 1765, money had flowed in vast quantities from Europe to India. In Roman times, uh, the Roman government was so worried about the massive drain of bullion from Rome to India that Pliny writes that, uh, uh, that there should be legal changes banning Roman women from wearing silk uh, dresses or, uh, or diam wearing diamonds from India uh, or using spices in their cooking because this was actually wrecking the Roman economy. And what was wrecking the Roman economy was obviously enriching the Indian economy. So this was the, the shape of world trade up to the point of this document. Money came from Europe, gold, silver, uh, and it ended up in Indian pockets. This document changed the direction of world trade. From this point, money flowed from India into British pockets. And within months of this document being signed, hundreds of thousands of pounds were being taken out of India and being used to enrich Britain, which up until that point was a fairly peripheral nation on the edge of Europe. We think of, uh, of uh, England and, and, and Great Britain being one of the richer countries of Europe. This wasn't the case uh, in the 16th century when the East India Company was founded. Uh, Portugal and Spain were the really rich countries, followed by Holland and Italy. Uh, and, and Britain was very much in the, in the kind of middle to lower end of the wealth. But after this document was signed, Britain rapidly becomes the richest country in Europe. When you go to those gorgeous National Trust houses dotted around the, uh, uh, the periphery of, of Great Britain, uh, you will, uh, if they're built in the uh, mid to late 18th century, the chances are that the money came either from money looted, uh, asset stripped by East India Company officials in India, or from the Caribbean slave trade. Always worth bearing in mind when you see one of those gorgeous uh, Georgian buildings that look as if Colin Firth is about to emerge and sort of straddle his way through a pond to the delight of assembled women in bonnets. The money came from Indian loot or the slave trade in the Caribbean. The background to the signing of this document called the Diwani or the Treaty of Allahabad was a tale of military triumph on the part of the East India Company and tragic humiliation uh, on the part of the Mughal Empire. Shuja Udawla, the governor of, uh, of Awad, which is modern Uttar Pradesh, the entire Gangetic plain, had got together with the uh, Nawab of Bengal, which was the richest province uh, uh, in India, uh, and uh, the Mughal Emperor, Shah Alam, and the three had declared war on the East India Company, a trading, a trading corporation which had taken over Bengal seven years earlier. They thought it would be a fairly easy thing to march in with their assembled and joined armies uh, to come together and just throw out these merchants. But there'd been a military revolution. The East India Company now had new muskets, uh, incredible artillery, file firing, a whole range of, of modern military techniques which they'd learnt from the Prussians and from Frederick the Great during the uh, War of the Austrian Succession. And these new military techniques were used with devastating effect on the old-fashioned Mughal cavalry armies. 
The Mughals thought they'd won at one point in the battle. They, they abandoned their posts and came to congratulate the, the general in charge, Shuja Udala. And this was the moment the East India Company seized their chance. They charged forwards, captured uh, a number of the leading Mughal generals, very nearly captured Shuja Udala, who only made his escape by being protected by naked Hindu Nagasadhus who held the bridgehead while he made his escape. In the immediate aftermath of the battle, Robert Clive, the man who had fought the Battle of Plassey seven years earlier and who had just returned to India as the Governor General of East India Company possessions in South Asia, came to Allahabad and met with the Mughal Emperor. And it was very much a meeting not of equals, uh, but now the East India Company was the ascendant force and Shah Alam was the defeated emperor who had lost the Battle of Buxar. He was forced into Clive's tent where a makeshift throne had been arranged on a dinner table with a, with a gold cloth thrown over it. It wasn't even a proper throne, it was just literally an armchair on a table. He was made to sit in it and there he signed the document we have in front of us here. And this document changed the course of both European and Asian history. Suddenly, the richest provinces of the Mughal Empire, which were Bengal, Bihar and Orissa, which between them had about one million weavers that produced about 40% of the world's gross domestic product. This entire area was given into the hands not of the British government, but a private corporation run out of one building in London, five windows wide in Leadenhall Street beneath what is now the Lloyds building in the city. This document changed everything. The Mughals were permanently impoverished and the East India Company began a march to world domination that within a few years led to them becoming major narco operators, uh, exporting opium uh, from India to China, buying tea there, which they exported to India, Europe and America. When the Boston Tea Party takes place, it is East India Company tea uh, bought with the profits of this treaty. Uh, that's, that sparks off the American Revolution. So this is a properly global document. You can say without any exaggeration, it not only changes the fate of India, but also the fate of Europe and America. This item here is actually a manuscript called the Divan of Minat, and it's actually a romance tale. Um, but what's important about this manuscript is that it was commissioned by a man named Richard Johnson, who was... Um, an East India Company officer who lived in Lucknow during the 1780s, and it's actually dated to 1782. But inside the manuscript, there's actually two portraits, one of Warren Hastings, and then the second one is of Richard Johnson himself. And Richard Johnson was quite an exceptional character and also collected as well as commissioned Indian miniature paintings relating to musical modes. And the British Library's core collection of Indian miniature paintings actually comes from Richard Johnson's collection, which he amassed, commissioned and collected in India and brought back to England. And on his death in 1807, it was sold to the East India Company's library. Richard Johnson was quite interested in looking at various manuscript traditions. He was interested in different languages and learning about different kinds of literature and commissioning works. And it's quite a fascinating publication or uh, manuscript because we really see the artist continuing to use the painting traditions that are traditionally um, the Indian miniature painting style of the region, but including portrait studies of Western figures within the manuscript. And in this case, they're actually wearing European or British uniforms within the setting of what you would normally see a Mughal emperor seated on a terrace. Um, but instead of seated on a carpet or on the floor, he's actually seated in a European chair. Our next item is a portrait of Warren Hastings by an Indian artist of the Mughal school, probably trained in the uh, Bengali Nawabi capital of Murshidabad. And it was in Murshidabad and also in Lucknow that you find some of the first great interactions taking place between British collectors and aesthetes who admire Indian art and the Indian artists who begin to work for them. Warren Hastings may have been one of the better 
East India Company governor generals, but the company he ran was still incredibly extractive. And in the 1780s, the big public scandal of the time was the impeachment of Warren Hastings. He may have been the wrong man, but he certainly represented uh, an organization that was engaged in, uh, in what today we would call war crimes. Uh, and uh, Parliament uh, was called in the House of Lords, trooped into Westminster Hall, and uh, Gibbon, Sheridan, the, the royal family, everyone turned up to watch Hastings going on trial. He may have been the wrong person to have been put on trial, but it was the one time that the British Parliament actually held their empire to account and put it on trial. The reason that Warren Hastings was impeached was a personal battle between him and his arch nemesis, a man called Philip Francis. Philip Francis rather wanted to be governor general himself. And the rivalry between these two East India Company officials culminated in one of the great events of uh, Calcutta scandal, which was a duel at dawn between Francis and Hastings. Both men were intellectuals, both were politically minded, neither had ever used a firearm before. Uh, and there's a comical uh, set too on the grounds of uh, Hastings House in Alipur when it turns out that both men haven't a clue how to fire the pistol. Luckily, they've both brought military seconds who load the guns for them. Uh, then Philip uh, Francis decides that he will fire first, but he, he misfires and he doesn't know how to use the pistol. And there's this kind of cartoonish um, moment when both of them try to use the pistols and fail to do it. Eventually, Francis uh, manages to fire his pistol, but he misses. And Warren Hastings then pulls the trigger and he actually hits Philip Francis, but only in the ribs. Uh, Francis is carried off in a palanquin and he goes back to England, deciding to destroy his rival. And it's his action and his connivance with Edmund Burke that leads to the impeachment of Warren Hastings in Parliament, one of the great scandals of the 18th century. The third item is one of the most controversial rulers in Indian history. Depending on where you stand in the political spectrum, Tipu Sultan today is either regarded as one of the great nationalist heroes of India or a jihadi monster who destroyed temples uh, and humiliated the Hindus he conquered. The truth, as usual, lies somewhere in between. A lot of the reputation for violence that Tipu has was partly due to East India Company propaganda. When Lord Wellesley, the, the Governor General and elder brother of the Duke of Wellington, who attacked Tipu Sultan and finally had him murdered and his, and his capital destroyed, when he began his assault on Tipu, the first thing he did was to turn on the propaganda machine. And you find the same words that are used by Western leaders wanting to attack Muslim rulers today being used by Wellesley of Tipu. He was a jihadi, he was a terrorist, he was a barbarian, he was a savage, he had no notions uh, of, uh, of civilization. These are the sort of things that Wellesley says about Tipu. In fact, we now know, thanks to documents here in the British Library, that Tipu was a remarkably innovative and far-sighted ruler. He introduced silk to Mysore, uh, he produced record output in agriculture through irrigation uh, and various other innovations uh, 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 to trade and industry. He founded a state trading company, rather like the East India Company, to trade to the Gulf. He bought ports in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Persian Gulf and in Oman and Yemen. Uh, he sent ambassadors to France and Afghanistan. And when you go to his capital today, Sri Rangapatnam, you find that the temple uh, is this huge pre-Tipu building, which is uh, he enhanced, he gave treasures to, he employed Hindus uh, in his highest administrative service. Uh, his, all his senior officials were Brahmin. So he was clearly a very different figure uh, to, the, uh, to the jihadi that uh, the East India Company portrayed him as. And it's a, a, a rather horrifying example how the same political traits which today besmirch the name uh, of our, of our neo-colonial invasions of other countries were put first into play by the East India Company in the 18th century. In particular, Tipu, of all Indian rulers, was the only one who never got into bed with the East India Company and made an alliance with them. He was always their implacable enemy. And even though he knew ultimately he had no hope of, of conquering the company, which then controlled most of India, 
he still continued hostilities. He said it's better to live a day as a lion than a lifetime as a sheep. According to a label on the back of the painting, it's believed that the painting was painted by an artist called Cherry, who presented it to Lord Cornwallis, who presented it to uh, Tipu Sultan's mother. However, um, based on the painting tradition and the style of the portrait study showing the ruler seated in profile, it's actually believed to be by a Madras-based artist. And this portrait's quite important because this type of iconography showing Tipu Sultan in profile, seated against a bolster and facing towards our left is actually quite iconic and has been replicated throughout the tradition of Indian miniature painting. Here at the British Library, inside the Asian and African Reading Room, visitors and readers who wish to consult the East India Company archives can do so. We're sitting on basements of storage filled with the East India Company's archives. We have everything from original treaties to private papers, manuscripts in multiple languages, not just Persian, but also Hindi, Urdu, Sanskrit, Telugu, as well as we have about half a million photographs, prints, drawings, and paintings relating to the subcontinent. So among the many treasures which have found their way to the British Library from the old East India Company office is this picture of the Persian king Nadir Shah. And the East India Company had good reason to be thankful to Nadir Shah because he was the man who really destroyed Mughal power. In 1739, he came down from Persia, defeated the Mughal Emperor Muhammad Shah Rangila with the latest military technology, something called the swivel gun, which could pierce any Mughal armor. And then he captured the Mughal Emperor, rode into his capital. Six weeks later, he left with the Koh i Noor, with the Darya Noor, its sister diamond, the peacock throne, and 8,000 wagons.